the life of Charles Darwin. www.livingwaters.com Charles R. Darwin was born in Shrewsbury, England on February 12, 1809. He was one of six children that were born into an affluent family. The Voyage of the Beagle At age 22, Darwin was offered a spot as a naturalist aboard the HMS Beagle, a British Navy survey vessel. The ship was about to set sail on a two-year expedition surveying the coast of South America. Charles readily agreed, and his life was forever changed. HMS Beagle during the voyage of 1831 through 1836. The trip lasted nearly five years, giving Darwin ample time to explore South America, the Galapagos, and other islands in the Pacific Ocean. In 1816, at seven years old, Charles is already showing an interest in botany. As the Beagle's naturalist, Darwin studied the many species of plants and animals that he observed. He came to believe that species had similarities because they were related. It was while studying the variations among the Galapagos mockingbirds in 1835 through 1836 that Darwin first considered the evolution of species. It was during the journey that he saw the cruelties of slavery and wondered how it was that God could permit such cruelty to exist. Darwin never entirely discounted the existence of God, but gradually became agnostic. In On Origin of Species, he refers to creation as the works of God and mentions the Creator seven times. 1837. Darwin draws an evolutionary tree in his notebook below the words, I think. In 1851, Darwin was devastated when his daughter Annie died. By then, his faith in Christianity had dwindled. Alfred Russell Wallace 1858 Charles receives a letter from naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, who informs him that he had independently developed an almost identical theory of Darwin's natural selection. 1858, July 1st, both Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace have their beliefs presented at the Linnean Society. Charles attended the funeral for his youngest son on the same day as the meeting, so he wasn't able to present his, this thesis. Darwin at the age of 45 in 1854. In 1859, Charles Darwin published On the Origins of Species. In 1871, caricature showing Darwin with an ape body. In 1871, Darwin's The Descent of Man is published. He maintains that the gap between the savages and the civilized races would become wider, like the gap he saw between the white races and the ape. There would no longer be a closeness but such as the one he saw between the Negro and the gorilla. The break will then be rendered wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope than the, ca the Caucasian whites and some ape as low as a baboon instead of at present between the Negro blacks or Australian and the gorilla. An aging Darwin at 59. Charles Darwin believed that the black race was closer to the gorilla than the white race, but he thought that they were friendly, well behaved, and intelligent. His attitude was similar to that of a man who likes trained dogs. He thinks that they are friendly, well behaved, and some are extremely intelligent. Clap, clap. Okay, now sit. Good boy. On the Origins of Species, published tw 24 November 1859, was originally titled On the Origin of Species by the Means of Natural Selection for the Preservation of Favored Races 
in the struggle for life. He also believed that natural selection was left men more intelligent than women. The chief distinction in intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than can women, whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of senses and hands. <clears throat> Dunce, scratch, scratch. A woman looks down on Darwin, portrayed as a monkey. Published in 1872. Darwin said, One general law of natural selection is, Let the strongest live and the weakest die. Chapter 7. Instinct. Hitler put the theory of Darwinism into practice. As clearly evidenced in Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, Hitler wrote, The stronger must dominate and not mate with the weaker which would signify the sacrifice of its own hi higher nature. Only the born weakling can look upon this principle as cruel, and if he does so, it is merely because he is of a feebler nature and a narrower mind. For if such a law did not direct the process of evolution, then the higher development of organic life would not be conceivable at all. Dodge Al concentration camp victims, Hitler's Nazi Germany. In the introduction of Origins of Species, 1859, Darwin wrote, A fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. So let's look at both sides of the argument. First, let's look at if there is empirical evidence for evolution. If Darwin was right, the fossil recorded should reveal millions of transitional forms between major groups like reptiles, birds, or fish, and amphibians. Darwin understood that this evolutionary theory was dependent on finding these intermediates, or missing links. Now, 150 years later, despite the discovery of a hundred million fossils, there are only a handful of disputable disputable examples. For example, Archaeopteryx isn't an intermediate form between reptiles and birds as, as was once believed. It is rather an in extinct bird with a few different features to those of present day birds. The millions of missing links are still missing. The Department of Paleobiology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History is one of the leading centers for paleontological research in the world. The world-class collections include 40 million to 50 million fossil plants, animals, and geologic specimens. Also included in the collections are more than 1,500 cataloged specimens of dinosaurs. The Smithsonian has millions of fossils, but they have no undisputed transitional forms. Millions of fossils survived, but transitional forms didn't survive because conditions weren't conducive. Millions did, but they didn't. Why is that? I believe that it's because they didn't exist in the first place. Charles Darwin was onto something when he said, often a cold shudder has run through me and I have asked myself whether I have not devoted myself to a fantasy. Charles Darwin, Life and Letters, 1887, Volume 2, page 229. In 1882, Charles Darwin tragically dies and is buried next to Isaac Newton in Westminster Abbey. This was taken in 1881, thought to be the last photograph of Darwin before his death. Here is an important question for you. What do you think happens after someone dies? Do you think there is a heaven? If there is one, are you good enough to go there? Are you a good person? Here's a quick test. How many lies have you told in your life? 
Have you ever stolen anything or used God's name in vain? Jesus said, Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. Have you looked with lust? Will you be guilty on Judgment Day? If you have done those things, God sees you as a lying, thieving, blasphemous adulterer at heart. And the Bible warns that if you are guilty, you will end up in hell. But God, who is rich in mercy, loves you so much that he became a sinless human, being in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The Savior died an excruciating death on the cross, taking your puni punishment upon himself. We broke the law, the Ten Commandments, but he became a man to pay our fine. Then Jesus rose from the dead, defying death. That means God, the judge, who can freely dismiss your case and commit your death sentence. If you repent, turn from your sins, and place your trust in Jesus alone, that means God can legally let you walk out of the courtroom. God himself can cleanse you and give you the righteousness of Christ. To receive the gift of eternal life, you must repent and trust in Jesus, as you would put on a parachute, trusting in him alone for your salvation. That means you must forsake your own good works as a means of trying to please God, trying to bribe him, and trust only what Jesus has done for you. Simply throw yourself on the mercy of the judge. Do it right now because you don't know when you will die. Pray something like this, Dear God, today I turn away from all of my sins and name them. And I put my trust in Jesus Christ alone as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me, change my heart, and grant me your gift of everlasting life. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Now, have faith in God. He is absolutely trustworthy. Never doubt His promises. He is not a man that should lie. The sincerity of your prayer will be evident by your obedience to God's will. So read the Bible daily and obey what you read. Then go to www.livingwaters.com and click on Save Yourself Some Pain. There you will find principles that will help you grow in your faith. You might like to get the Evidence Bible, which answers a hundred of the most common questions about the Christian faith. Its informative commentary will help you grow as a Christian, and please don't toss this comic aside. If it's been helpful to you, pass it on to someone you care about. There's nothing more important than where they will spend eternity. Thank you for reading this. Sincerely, Ray Comfort.